There's been numerous occasions over the years through my videos and presentations that I've made reference to an emotional connection to the landscape. Now that statement in isolation, it kind of sounds a bit wishy-washy, you know, what does it even mean to have an emotional connection to the landscape and how can we make sense of it to better understand how it can positively influence our photography? It's something that I've reflected on quite frequently so that I can better express my own personal connection through the images that I make. Now I think it was almost two years ago that I made a video about capturing emotion, but today I want to discuss something that's a bit more practical and something which you can take away with you today and start to work on even if your movements are restricted because of a, a national lockdown like we've got here in the UK. And that's an understanding of our preferred subject matter and why it's important in the process of making images which are both fulfilling and meaningful, you know, kind of meaningful to you, you know, that have substance, kind of add meat to the bone, if you like. So let's go back a few years when little old me was wandering around in the local countryside and local woodland, like a little lost hobbit, <laughs> kind of whinging to myself about my own problems, uh, certainly to myself because Meg wasn't interested in listening. Um, but anyway, back then, part of my approach of photography was purely about making images of things which caught my attention, whether it was a nice looking tree or a, a nice view or a, some beautiful light. You know, it's just about, like many of us, just following my instinct and gut. And it was exactly what I needed at the time. You know, not too much deep thought into the process, but purely just to enjoy the process and just make images of things which were just simply aesthetically pleasing. Now, I've loved the great outdoors my whole life, you know, in different forms. And I think over that period of time, you pick up on bits of knowledge here and there, whether it's through conversation or through reading or simply through observation and experience. So I kind of had a pretty good idea of some of the things that I was choosing to photograph. You know, it was, I felt it was pretty easy to identify something such as the grand old English oak or a delicate silver birch. But it kind of reached the point where I felt it was necessary to deepen my understanding of both location and subject. Necessary because I had a sense of this developing emotional connection to the landscape. And so an understanding became this prerequisite to bolstering that connection through empathy and knowledge and an improvement in my photography through informed decisions. But also this kind of sense of improvement in my work by you know, making images with meaning, meaning that's guided by knowledge, not knowledge of photography, but knowledge of the trees that I was choosing to shoot. So let me go through some practical examples based on trees and woodland, as that's the kind of area of my expertise, if you like. Firstly, knowledge of our subject can inform our choices on where to shoot and when. So rather than simply going to a woodland based upon the weather, we can target a particular location or species based upon the time of year and our understanding of the behaviors and characteristics of the location and the trees within. For example, autumn colors in my local silver birch I know are more likely to start and finish before the oak trees. Some woodlands become inaccessible in the summer due to dense bracken growth, so I know that I must target those places before the bracken takes hold but possibly while the fresh bracken shoots unfurl in May. The rowan, also known as mountain ash with its ash-like leaves, produce berries in late summer and in certain locations will hold on to them until after the leaves have dropped, leaving silvery branches adorned with red jewels. There's this fantastic woodland close to home which I now realise is worth the vast majority of my time throughout April and May, and that's to target the garlic, bluebells and blossom as this particular location kind of loses its luster a little bit later in the year, just in time for some of the oak woods to become fresh and vibrant on a wet day in June. Essentially, in a world where we're not time rich, we can allocate effective use of our time to maximize creative output through knowledge of trees and location. Also consider how silver birch have beautiful red branches in the winter and they colonize quite happily on these dry, rocky terrains, or how they become delicate and magical in a frost or how silver birch become painterly under soft light. How the character of thick fissured oak tree branches come to life in winter as their twisting forms are revealed. But how in the summertime the canopy offers a softening effect and natural frame. 
Perhaps our beech trees develop a dark sheen when wet. Or a Scots pine may even look almost varnished. Alder trees are common near riversides and wet woodlands, as interestingly, the alder wood doesn't rot underwater. I find them to be beautiful in spring, but become less appealing against the colourful displays of autumn, but perhaps provide a contrasting cold backdrop to the splendour of beech trees. Maybe much of this is obvious to some of you, but if not, then I promise you there is great pleasure in noticing, observing and learning from these changes through the seasons. The not so obvious lessons to be learned, which kind of deepen our understanding of the subject matter, is an awareness and knowledge that inspires images which tell stories, or perhaps hold that quality that so many of us strive for, meaning. Of course, meaning doesn't have to come from a knowledge of subject matter, because we all interpret and find meaning in different ways. But I personally found that my hit rate increased when I became more empathetic and caring about location and subject. An empathy that was derived from tuning into the behaviour of trees to inspire themes, ideas and metaphors. For example, did you know that a strong native beech tree can grow through the canopy of an oak tree, spread its crown over the top of the oak and bully it into submission? So you end up with this thriving beech tree and this flopped over dying oak. Now, after reading about this, I went into a local woodland and I actually witnessed this behaviour. So that knowledge had allowed me to see what had happened there and understand what was going on in the woodlands that I was exploring. And when it comes to making a photograph, it would undoubtedly influence your interpretation of that scene because you now have meaning, structure and a story to be told. You know, there's stories don't have to be told by forcing a narrative. The stories are already there. We just need the understanding to be able to see them. Now, the audience of your work might not necessarily understand your intentions, but that informed approach will offer cohesiveness and depth to your images that you'll personally find rewarding. Also, I'd like to recommend a book to read for knowledge, inspiration, and indeed imagination. It's called The Hidden Life of Trees. Now, I've had a copy of this since pff, before I even started this YouTube channel in 2016 and I found it absolutely fascinating. And indeed, it's inspired some of my own thinking in woodland photography, so highly recommend it. I'll pop a link in the description below. Finally, I'd like to draw your attention to my brand new Patreon account. Now, I've set this up with a number of different tiers so that if you'd like to, you can support my work and just allow me to keep producing content that's fresh and authentic and free of sponsorship. Now, the reason why I've done this now all these years later is because the pandemic's just highlighted this need to try and find a way to fund the production of videos without sacrificing quality and integrity. So please take a look um, if you'd like to support and help keep Meg well fed and pampered too. Um, but yes, please consider becoming a patron. Uh, your support for this channel and the messages that I have to share are massively appreciated, so thank you. Now that's it for this, this episode. Hope you've enjoyed it and found it interesting, but thank you very much for watching and I hope to see you again soon.